You know, life, life has its ups and downs, and I think that on the whole, the role that podcasting plays in the, role, in, in the life of both producers and, and listeners is as a flotation device. It's not an anchor, man. I don't think podcasting is like, a, is like a chain. It's not lead boots that are dragging us down to the bottom. It's a buoy that can hold us above the surface. That's great for society. I think it, I think it creates a healthier and happier society. Please join me in welcoming Mike Duncan. Most of the time, I think about the content that is going into any individual episode of my show. which It's a weekly show. I have a deadline every Sunday night, and I have to hit it, and all I think about is what I'm doing. This week, I, before I came here, I was thinking about uh, the rapid industrialization of the Russian Empire in the early 1890s. Uh, that is typically the kind of thing that I think about. I very rarely step back and actually think in a meta way about what podcasting is. Um, like, what is it good for? What possesses us to create podcasts? What possesses us to listen to podcasts? Uh, why do we pour our hearts, our time, our soul, and our money into these shows? Um, so I want to ask the question, what is the point of all this? for creators, for listeners, and for society as a whole. So when I think about what it is that I get out of podcasting, why I started it, why I keep doing it, the very first thing that always leaps to my attention is a sense of creative fulfillment. I think that there is an innate desire inside of human beings for self-expression to create something new. You have something that is inside of you, whatever it is. It could be in fashion, it could be in art, it could be in writing or music or knitting or any number of different small and large hobbies. Everybody wants, everybody has something inside of them, no matter how big or how small, that wants to come out of them. And I certainly have things that want to come out of me. And my creative process, which is just reading books, and taking notes and taking very complex historical issues and trying to work through them like a puzzle to figure out how on earth I can explain something as complicated as the fall of the Roman Empire or as complicated as the French Revolution and make it intelligible to people so that they understand what actually happened. This is a creative, fulfilling endeavor for me. The actual writing of the transcripts, I love writing sentences, I love crafting sentences, I love making paragraphs, I love putting them down on a page, and then that, all of that creative expression is what I get out of doing a podcast as a producer of a podcast. That sense of, that desire for creative fulfillment is then, you get this bonus if you follow through to the end, which is this thing called a sense of accomplishment. Right? A sense of accomplishment is a profoundly important and cool thing to have in your life. Most of the time, and I, I'm talking about myself here, I mean, people say, oh, the history of Rome, it was a great idea, you did a great job. Okay, well, that was one of about a thousand different things that I've started and quit at various times in my life. You pick things up, you try them out, sometimes no matter how much energy you have going into it, it peters out. And after a while, you know, you can, you, you want to have finished something, have done something with your life. Um, I think people want that. And so every week, every podcast episode that you put out, every podcast episode that I put out, when I hit upload, you know, I sit back and I have about five minutes where I'm, I get to ride a little emotional high and say, yeah, I did it. I did it. I did something else. I have a sense of accomplishment that sort of courses through me. And then after that five minutes, of course, next week's deadline starts looming. And I say, oh, okay, I have to get back to work now and go back to my creative fulfillment um, because I have to have a new episode out next Sunday. Um, so you get that we are fulfilling ourselves creatively. We are surrounding ourselves often with a sense of accomplishment that we did something. And then there's this other little uh, subtle joy that can come out of this which, uh, to put a fancy label on it, you would say it's honing your craft. Or simply put, it's getting better at something. 
the feeling that you get from getting better at something is fantastic. And this is true not just of podcasting. I mean, this is true if you're a musician. Anybody who has ever started to try to play a musical instrument knows that there is a real subtle and persistent joy that comes from trying to play a song the first time and just fumbling your way through it and then playing it 10 more times and feeling yourself get better at it and then playing it after 20 times and 30 times. Now suddenly you can kind of do it without thinking about it and then you get even better at it and you can do it, you know, now, you can, now you're thinking of little different ways that you could play it. That honing of the craft and I, I can tell you when I go back and listen to the early, ep how, do you guys all have listened to the history of Rome? Okay, so when I go back and listen to the early episodes of the history of Rome, they are a little mortifying, you know? It's very much, hello, welcome to the history of Rome, my name's Mike Duncan, we're going to talk about. So it's, and there's a feeling that you can kind of get, and people ask me, well, are you ever going to go back and re-record it? The answer is that no, I'm not going to go back and re-record it. I'm not pulling George Lucas on the history of Rome. I'm not going to start inserting uh, tauntauns into the early Roman kingdom. <laughs> but what I feel about that is not so much like, you know, shame at how bad I was, but kind of joy at how much better I am at it now. And I hope that five years down the road, I even look at the stuff that I'm doing right now and I'm like, yeah, man, I'm better than I was then. I always want to be getting better. And there's this great story about this. Uh, there's a cellist. There's a really great cellist. Uh, his name is Pablo Casals. Does anybody know who Pablo Casals is? Pablo Casals? It's technically Pablo Casals, right? In honor of how he actually wants to pronounce his name, we call him Pablo. Uh, so he's, you know, arguably the greatest cellist in the world. He's uh, early 20th century to mid 20th century. And when he was very late in his career, we're talking like the 1960s, he was still practicing like six hours a day. He's an old man. He's like when he goes and plays shows, it's like here comes the greatest cellist in the world, Paulo Casals. And they asked him, uh, why do you keep practicing six hours a day? And he said, well, I'm beginning to see some improvement. <laughs> and that is meaningful, right? Getting better at something all the time is awesome. So if you keep at it and you keep at it week after week, you're going to get better at it. And then the last thing that I will say about what I get out of this is what... Anybody who produces an educational piece of work that's 10 minutes or 15 minutes, or in my case, it's usually 20 or 25 minutes, um, you know that you are not putting in a lot of things, right? The, the actual writing and editing process is a lot about not saying something or taking something that took me three or four paragraphs to write and condensing that into a single sentence and just being like, yes, it was chaotic for three weeks and then just kind of blowing through that little period because otherwise we'll be here for three weeks if I try to explain to you every, every single twist and turn. People sometimes accuse me of going through every single twist and turn in history and that's not true. I leave a lot of them out. Um, but what I'm left with then is in the process of producing a piece of educational content, an episode or a series to explain it to all of you, I am sitting on top of a mountain of information that didn't even make it into the show, and now I'm walking around having educated myself. I'm walking around because I'm trying to explain it to you. I now have all of this additional information that is rattling around inside my head, and I think anybody who does a show has that same feeling of being profound, feeling profoundly more educated about something just because you had to go through the process of learning it so that you could explain it to somebody else. Um, so those are the things that I think about. If somebody's going to ask me the question, what do you get out of podcasting? It's all of those things. Now, there's this other stuff that has happened as a result of me keeping at this for quite a while and having some measure of success. I've, I've gotten some recognition. I uh, have a degree of popularity. I got invited to this thing to do a keynote address um, in front of all of you guys right now. I got, a, I got a book out of it. I have a second book that I'm writing. And all of those things, though, don't really impact me on a daily basis. You know, if I hit upload on an episode, my lived experience is about the same if I have one person download that episode or I have 100,000 people download that episode. I'm still doing the same basic work that I was doing in July of 2007 when I got started. I'm reading books, I'm taking notes, I'm trying to figure out how to explain this to people, I'm writing up a transcript, I'm editing it, I am recording it, I am publishing it, and then I'm starting that process over again. My daily life, my weekly life is pretty much all the same. So when you go into this as somebody who wants to produce a podcast or if you're thinking about doing it, 
those are the things that you should take away from your work is the creative fulfillment, the, sel the sense of accomplishment, the feeling of getting better at something, and then educating yourself and you know, in your own head, having a richer understanding of the world that you're living in. And if you go into it being like, I'm gonna start a podcast because I'm gonna get rich and famous. <laughs> Number one, <laughs> no you're not. <laughs> Maybe you will, Dan Carlin did. Dan Carlin's pretty famous. Um, but your life is actually going to be enriched by the creative process far more than any sort of fleeting or superficial fame that you might get out of it. So I think if you're going to start a podcast, you should definitely not be going into it thinking, what I want to get out of this is fame and riches. What you should be wanting to get out of it is creative fulfillment and a sense of accomplishment. Um, and that's what I still, to this very day, after 12 years, that's still exactly what I get out of producing my podcasts every week. Um, and sometimes a sense of fear because I have an episode due out tomorrow that still isn't finished yet. Um, so then we move on to the listeners, okay? We, we can't actually do any of this without listeners, and most of us aren't just podcast creators. We, are, we listen to podcasts too. I listen to podcasts. I mostly listen to baseball podcasts uh, because I need a break, um, and I also will... Uh, binge, I will find a certain show and then I will just binge on it as many of us do. I do all the same things I'm currently uh, have discovered. I'm way late to this party, but um, You Must Remember This by Karina Longworth. Does anybody know that podcast? I'm, gonna, I'm plugging it right now because I'm like listening to it obsessively. It's fantastic. It's about early 20th century Hollywood history. It's great. Um, so what do we then as listeners, not as podcast creators, or what do our listeners get out of this? And first and foremost, what listeners get out of it is new, new information, information that you didn't have before. One of the reasons why you pick up an educational podcast is because you don't know about something, you want to learn more about it. So what you get by plugging in your headphones and listening to it is new information. And there are so many people out there who have expertise in passion in all number of little niches that can all on their own be, you didn't even know that you wanted to learn about, but if you plug it in, you will learn new information about something that you knew nothing about before. And I think I'm, I'm possibly a bit of a podcast enthusiast on this front, but I find the world to be full of a lot of noise. Um, Television, I find to be full of a lot of noise. You know, the 24 hour cable news, the signal to noise ratio in 24 hour cable news, I find to be uh, disappointingly low, if I could be diplomatic about it. Um, I think that the signal to noise ratio in podcasting is quite high because most of the time, the people who are producing shows, especially educational shows, are oftentimes getting to the point. Here's, here's what the topic is, and I'm going to explain it to you. Here's, what, here's what something you didn't know about, and I'm going to explain it to you. And so in your life, where we are often surrounded by just a, a cloud of informational bright noise, um, a podcast can cut through that and give you really rich, pure signal. And I don't know about you guys, but my brain often craves pure signal. I want information. I want new information. I mean, I am, you know, I mean, Johnny Five, the robot from Short Circuit. I don't know if that is now officially too old of a reference to make. <laughs> Probably. It's a good movie. I watched it like two years ago. It holds up really well. Um, it's actually pretty funny. So we have this, I think podcasting has this fantastic signal to noise ratio um, where you're getting new information. What are the other things that a listener gets out of listening to a podcast? Um, I think, and I'm going to use a, a swear word right now, be prepared, but it turns the shitty part of our lives into awesome parts of our lives. And what I mean by that is where do we listen to podcasts the most? Most of the time it's like commutes, right? When you actually have to physically move your body from where you live to where you work. There is nothing character building about a commute. <laughs> There's nothing great about a commute. Nobody likes commuting. Nobody likes being stuck in traffic or standing on an overcrowded subway. Um, I don't. I don't think anybody does. You would have to be uh, a different sort of person to be like, yes, commuting. I love it. Traffic is great. So when you are, and then, the, but the other things, not just commuting, but doing chores. I listen to podcasts when I'm, when I'm doing the dishes, you know, like I'm, I'm doing chores. All of these sort of the mechanical drudgery 
of our lives that we have to do to maintain ourselves to actually make it to work so we can have the, so they give us these little bio survival tickets that we can turn in and exchange for food and rent and things. Um, in order to do that, we need to suffer through this, these parts of mechanical drudgery. Often these things involve using our hands or using our bodies, so we can't sit down and watch uh, a TV show or a YouTube video. We, it's even sometimes hard to read a book. You know, even if you're on the subway, reading a book can be difficult. Um, but you can always put in headphones and listen to something. And if you discover podcasts that you are interested in, that you are excited about, um, you know, people, I put my shows out on Sunday night and I have, I've gotten plenty of emails from people that say to me that the Monday, their Monday morning commute used to be the worst part of their whole week. You know, getting up on Monday morning and driving to work is traditionally really terrible. But people say, but now I have this new episode, back in the day it was the history of Rome, now it's revolutions. I have a new episode of revolutions to listen to, and instead of this being one of the worst parts of my week, it has become one of the best parts of my week. And I think that that is a profoundly cool thing that we are offering to people, that we are taking these parts of their lives that are not so great, and this is me too, you know, I'm talking about myself too, the parts of my life that aren't so great, and now I get to listen to cool, new, interesting things. And then, uh, podcasts also being a sort of uniquely, it's a, it's a uniquely intimate media, um, audio is. Like when you have somebody actually talking in your head, it's a, it's a different experience than even listening to a band play music or certainly watching a movie or a TV show. As much as you might love a TV show or a movie, there's always something that separates you from what you're watching. And there is something about listening to a podcast that plugs you into this community that plugs you into the show. And if you listen to like uh, a panel show where there's like two or three people and they're getting together every week to talk about something new, like when you start listening to that, you just feel like you're sitting at the table with them, that these people are your friends. Like, oh, there's my buddy. They're, we're all gonna hang out together and talk about whatever proper football or talk about baseball, which is often what I'm listening to. And so you get to create there, there are communities that are then created that connect us to each other, that connect uh, listeners to the people that they're listening to. Then when I come out and I come to something like this, people just walk up to me and they say, hey man, we painted my house together, so thank you very much. Uh, I ran a marathon with you. Like, okay, great. So now can I check ran a marathon off my bucket list? Because I don't think I'm gonna run a marathon just on my own or I did a cross country drive and you were with me the whole way. Like, like as producers, we get to participate in people's lived experience and as listeners, you get to have somebody who's like there along for the ride with you, who is like a really well known, um, uh, a friend of yours basically, who is explaining to you often very interesting things because I do believe uh, in the signal to noise ratio brilliance of podcasting. So that's what we get. We get to have a sense of community. We get to bond with each other. And that connects, you know, life in these modern times can be isolating. It can be alienating. And I think that podcasting can and does help break through that, which segues into um, the last piece of this, which is, okay, I get something out of it as a producer. Um, I get creative fulfillment, I get a sense of accomplishment, I get to learn all of these cool things as I try to explain them to you. And listeners get new information, the crummy parts of their day are now good parts of their day. We have, we have a community that has now grown up. And is that good for society to have all of that going on? I sure think so. I think it's great to have people walking around feeling creatively fulfilled and walking around with a sense of accomplishment. I think it's great for people to have taken the crummy parts of their day and made them good parts of their day. I think it's good for the mental health of individuals out there. And I think it creates kind of a, a psychological and emotional like buoy for us as we go through our lives. Um, you know, life, life has its ups and downs. And I think that on the whole, the role that podcasting plays in the, role, in the life of both producers and, and listeners is as a flotation device. It's not an anchor, man. I don't think podcasting is like, a, is like a chain. It's not lead boots that are dragging us down to the bottom. It's a buoy that can hold us above the surface. That's great for society. I think it, I think it creates a healthier and happier society. Um, I also think, just in general, I, I work in, in history specifically, but this is, this is roughly true of any educational, any educational field or any educational topic, is that everybody walks away better informed and I often think more reflective in your daily life. Because if you learn something new, 
you normally don't just, I mean, maybe Johnny Five did this, is just learn something new and store it in his data banks. His data banks? It's, da it's data banks. Um, but normally when you get new information, whether you like it or not, whether you think you're doing it or not, you're often going to wind up then reflecting on what you were just told. You're going to turn it over in your brain and you're going, to ha you're going to be much more used to taking in new information and reflecting on that information. And I think that that habit of reflection is again, really, really good. It, I think it, I, I'm going to say it, I think podcasting makes better citizens. I really do. Um, and for me, you know, I work in history, as I said, I think that even if you don't, you know, even if I hand you a test on the Roman Empire right now, and you can't necessarily pass a test on the Roman Empire, if I say, you know, who came, you know, after Decius, and you might say, I don't remember. Um, I think that the fact that people, if, if we as historians, if I can just speak about history for a second, if we as historians can expand the timeline that people are living their lives. If you're not just living this life that is like, if it's more than three months ago, it's ancient history, and if it's more than three months from now, it's so far in the future we can't even think about it. If we can expand that to where you're now placing your life on a timeline that, you know, 2,000 years ago, things were going on, right? Just remember that 2,000 years ago, things were going on that have an influence on where we are today. And I, when I go to like, uh, let's say like a national history museum, wherever, like in Europe, and you go, the, the early parts of those are usually chronological and you'll find these like fish hooks or spearheads and they, it's marked like, oh yeah, we found this, it's 100,000 years old. This blows, this still blows my mind. And they're like really good. They're not crummy fish hooks. They're like really well done fish hooks. Like I was, at, I was in Copenhagen at the Copenhagen National. They pulled them out of a bog. They're really good. 100,000 years ago, these things are being made. And that alone just in, expands and enlightens my own mind, just contemplating life on a scale that big. I won't bring the geologists into it because anytime I get off on like 100,000 years ago was such a long time ago, there's always some geologist that's like, yeah, man. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Four billion years ago is a long time. And then um, to, to wrap this up, um, the, I really love the symbiotic relationship between listeners and creators and the fact that as creators, we're listeners. And I think that as a listener, I think you, you should be thinking about what can I do? How can I contribute to this body? If anybody tells you you shouldn't start a podcast because, oh, there's so many podcasts, you should just start a podcast. That's what I think. And um, it's like telling somebody they shouldn't start a band because there's so many bands out there. Right? Nobody ever says to somebody, oh, there's so many bands, you shouldn't start a band. Like, start a band. If you want to start a band, you should start a band, too. That's also very creatively fulfilling, and it gives you a sense of accomplishment. Um, all of this works for starting a band, too, in case you're wondering. Um, so I love this mutually reinforcing symbiotic relationship between listeners and creators. And I think it, again, it, it helps all of our emotional health to be here participating in all of this. So, uh, so when we ask the question, what is the point of all this? Um, I will, I'm just gonna read this paragraph I wrote because I've honed my craft and so I wanna get this exactly right. Um, what is the point of all this? It is about podcasters creatively expressing themselves in some area where they have a unique and special expertise or passion. They get a feeling of creative fulfillment, self-expression, and a sense of accomplishment. This creates a wonderful variety of information streams for listeners out there to choose from, an array of very strong signals that people can pick up and listen to that will enrich their own lives with new information, overcoming the mechanical drudgery parts of their day and finding them and placing them inside of a community. This all works as a feedback loop that makes everyone on both sides of the process a little bit better than they were before, which I feel can only lead to an improved, more, connection, uh, more connected, and hopefully more thoughtful society. And that is the point of all this. Thank you very much. How do you think uh, the techniques of a podcaster could better be better used to teach people history both substantively and as a discipline? Okay, so my, how, can, how can the techniques of podcasting be used to work, uh, to, to better disseminate historical knowledge to people? So one of my passions 
is, uh, I mean, obviously, if you've listened to the history of Rome or you've listened to revolutions, you know that I'm working in a sort of sub-genre of history that is historical narrative, right? I love history as storytelling. Um, I, when I was in the fifth grade, I had, a, I had a teacher when we were doing American history for the first time who would say, like, just sit there and I'm going to tell you a story about how these guys came together and staged this revolution and what happened at Yorktown. And I'm just going to tell you this as a story. I think a lot of the times, um, especially like in high school, they will, I don't want to, you know, say anything too mean about like football coaches out there. Um, football coaches are often put in charge of social studies or history and they're working from a, uh, from a list that says they need to know these dates and they need to know these terms and it often feels very disconnected and just some, just some bits of information that you need to learn for a test. Or then also more richly and robustly um, is there can often be thematic elements of history where you're talking about one particular, you know, like uh, the role of labor in some, over some long period of time. And I think that people often get, unfortunately, they get turned off to history because they don't really find a way to get into it for the first time. Like, what's going to get you into it for the first time that's going to keep making you wanting to come back? And I think that that can be accomplished by telling really accurate and enjoyable and informative stories about the past because everything that has happened up until now really is just people doing things. And if you just explain to people, this is, I mean, when I wrote, um, you know, when I'm writing about the French Revolution, people are like, this is so good and so fantastic. It's like, yeah, well, all I'm doing is telling you what happened. You know, I didn't, I'm not making, you know, I don't have to, you know, think anything up. I just have to tell you literally what people did. And I think that the, the material is inherently interesting to people. And I think that that can be the way that we get people who might be standoffish towards history into history is through narrative storytelling, which podcasting is, I think, really, truly uniquely suited for. Reflect on the moments where you know you said you started a bunch of things and like some petered out, but history of Rome stuck. And All of them petered out. <laughs> yeah. How, how did you know? Like, what was the point where you're like, oh, this thing is working, and the other things that you sort of put away? Like, how do you sort of balance between the the realization that you should keep on something versus like you should let something peter out? So I I quit the history of Rome famously. Um, does anybody know that that I quit the history of Rome? Some people were around. Um, when I got to Marius and Sulla, Sulla was about to march on Rome for the second time. And I, hit, I, I think that now the lingo for it is pod fade, um, where all of your initial enthusiasm that had carried you forward sort of peters out and runs dry, that initial burst of enthusiasm that you had. This is like, I don't know, maybe 30 episodes into it. Because the thing is, I was really into the Punic Wars at that time, and I had covered the Second Punic War in all of its glory. And then as I moved past that, I just sort of, at, at each episode became a little bit harder to put out and a little bit harder to put out. And then at one point, I just stopped putting out episodes. And like everything else that I had ever done with my drawer full of novels that are a third finished, um, you know, songs that I've written that have an initial verse and chorus, but I got two more verses to write and I didn't write two more verses for them. Um, it was just another thing that I started and then quit. And after, I, th I think it was about seven months of not doing it, that there was just this voice in my head that was saying, you, you should go back and finish this. Like, you should do that. Like, this, that was a good thing that you were doing. And you shouldn't leave it unfinished. You shouldn't walk away from this again feeling like you just quit something. And so I went back and I picked it up. And if you listen to the history of Rome, there's an episode where I say, it's been a while. I know. Because I was just picking back up where I left off. And that moment, it was, honest to God, one of the greatest decisions I ever made. Non-family division. Right, because like meeting my wife and asking my wife to marry me, that was like a really good decision. Um, restarting the history of Rome, non-family decision, or non-family uh, uh, category, was the best thing that I think I could have done. Because I, di I, I don't know when the feeling came, but it was sometime after I quit, but before I started it up again, where I felt in my heart that I was doing something wrong by leaving this unfinished. And when I did come back, 
after that, it was like I had a permanent, like it wasn't a second wind, it was just a permanent wind. And I never, then putting out episodes just became a part of the rhythm of my life. And it's very, it's very weird and abnormal if I don't have a show to put out. It's just a part of my daily lived life now. Um, and I've never felt pod fade about revolutions. Um, and so I think, th I think that's the answer is that first of all, you should, you should know that I did quit the history of Rome one time and I did come back to it. And I think that's po po probably why the second thing I think of when I think what did I get out of this is like a feeling that I accomplished something. Um, after setting down so many different things. Uh, I was going to say, one of the things I really admire about the history of Rome and similar content, um, I'm a history teacher online now, but in person before. And I'm a big believer that any subject is better taught when it's engaging, when it's interesting, and, and when there's a human element brought into it. Um, I know that I had a student when I was helping in an after school program who missed their day on the beginning of the Roman Empire. I gave her your podcast and said, if you don't like it, come back and let me know. We'll talk about it. And then she asked me for the second episode. Yeah. Um, just ringing endorsement from a high school student. I just dropped this off. Well, cool. Yeah. Um, but how do you find that balance between getting the full context and the depth of a subject, but also making it that engaging thing where a person doesn't feels like they can get it and is enjoying that experience? I think that part of that, um, one thing that I have tried to do from the very beginning is never talk down to my audience. Like, I will never treat the listener as if this is something that they, like I, I say right now, like I'm working on trying to explain this really complicated thing to somebody and that's a part of my creative process. But when, when I actually, what I actually produce and what people are actually listening to, I rarely say, or if, even, I don't even think I've ever said this, now this is gonna be difficult and convoluted and you're not, you're not gonna, this is gonna be too hard for you probably, so just tune out for five minutes. I think that if people are, ch I mean the word you could use is challenged, but if you just talk to anybody, like they're capable of understanding something, there's a part of their brain that will be like, whoa, what? Oh, okay, yeah, sure, I, let's dust this part of my brain off because people are often talked down to. People are often led to believe that, they, that something is too complicated, that they can't understand it, that they're not capable of understanding it. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of uh, childhood experiences and in high school, we are often walk away feeling like stupid, that we can't do something. And I don't think that that's true. And so I will always, and I will always write material for the listeners so that when they're listening to it, uh, they don't get the feeling like I'm talking down to them. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, I would have to look into like a psychological study, but I got to think that that has something, it connects to their ego a little bit. That, yo, oh, this person is talking to me like I'm a person, not like I'm less than them. And I think that that invites them into the process and it invites them to be like, yeah, I can do this, I can learn more. Um, and so I do think in all walks of life, right, like I think that it is really important to not talk down to people because I, in the grand scheme of things, the intelligent difference between like, you know, what you would call a dumb person, which is like a really subjective term anyway in terms of like IQ, and some genius level IQ. The difference between the low end of the spectrum and the higher end of the spectrum in any given, you know, um, nervous system sack of water that is wandering around on the earth compared to like literally a rock is very small. Like a rock is really dumb. It doesn't matter how much I try to invite a rock into the process of learning about the Roman Empire. The rock is just going to sit there. It's not going to get it. Um, trees, I don't know. Um, it's entirely possible we might figure out a way to explain the Roman Empire to a tree, um, but not a rock. But a human being, like the difference between what you would consider to be low intelligence versus high IQ in that very arbitrary um, constructed way, I think is so minuscule that we should never treat anybody like they're dumb or they can't get it. That's my answer. Finally. Okay. <laughs> no. um, you've, you've studied all these different periods, whether it's Rome or the French Revolution, now the Russian Revolution. Um, I feel like you, all these periods are very different, but the human element's always there, and sometimes some of the themes recur over and over. So like you know, you, you've talked about uh, revolutions eating their own children. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other themes that you really kind of see common between all these different things? Yeah, th there, what are these similarities? I do, I don't think, you know, uh, humanity's quest 
to find and identify this thing called human nature has always been a very fraught business, right? Anytime you're like, I think I've got it. I think I've got a piece of like universal human nature, like here in my hands. There's, you're always, the, the anthropologists then are gonna come in and say like, no man, I'm sorry. Uh, we found a group of people who don't exactly exhibit the behaviors that you just said are gonna be universal human behaviors. Um, but that said, I do think when it, because I'm often, I'm talking about political history, right? I do think that there are commonalities to the way that humans behave. We need to eat, we need to find food, right? We need to drink, we need to find water. When it's cold, we need to find warmth. When it's hot, we want to go someplace cool. And those sorts of things do create common drives, whether you're talking about the Romans or whether you're talking about um, ancient Chinese history or whether you're talking about modern day, just contemporary events, there are commonalities to how the biological organism that is human needs to respond to its environment. And I also think that there is an array of sort of emotional faculties that do recur over and over again. There is love. People fall in love. Right? People are attracted to each other, they fall in love, and they have babies. There is jealousy, right? That's a thing that pops up. There's hatred, that pops up. There is joy and laughter. These things are found everywhere. I'll bet that if you go back 100,000 years to some cave in France, that they were swapping jokes. I bet there was laughter back then. <laughs> laughter is something that you find everywhere. Um, so there are these things. And then, of course, when I'm talking about political revolutions in the Roman Empire, there is this sort of Nietzschean will to power that is not necessarily universal in every single person, but it's gonna show up in just about every society. And those people who feel that will to power and domination then wind up at loggerheads with each other. And that's kind of the story, that's the political history of humanity. That you are, if you're talking about politics and human politics and how we govern society, going all the way back, I'm, you know, if you look at what chimpanzees get up to in Africa, you know, one of those chimps has got a will to power over, you know, whoever the alpha chimp is at this moment, and they get into a tussle. That's something that reoccurs so much that I think you can get very close to saying this is something like human nature that does occur. And I think that because we have these sort of basic emotional building blocks and biological urges, that we do sometimes combine and recreate patterns of behavior. And certainly you see patterns of behavior in revolutions. And you know, I saw patterns of behavior. When I wrote The Storm Before the Storm, you know, what was happening then, yes, reminds me a little bit of the contemporary United States and not in a good way, um, but also to all the various revolutions that I studied. I do see similarities between them. Um, so, so I think that that will, and that will continue to happen as long as there are human beings. I think that these things, there will be laughter, there will be joy, there will be love, there will be hatred, um, there will be probably, unfortunately, dishonesty. Somebody's gonna tell a lie somewhere. Um, you know, there, there's, an, there's an old philosophical discussion of like, if we colonize the moon or Mars, how long will it take for a murder to be committed on Mars? There's never been a murder committed on Mars, but if you put people on Mars, eventually one of them is gonna kill another one. There's that that exists too. Are there any, was that, was that joyful enough? I tried to talk about the joy and the laughter. I mean, come on, and the love, it, it was all a part of it. In the very back, in the very back. Are we getting some, maybe, possibly, some, uh, some Roman history special for Saturnalia like you used to? <laughs> you know, the little cultural thing that didn't make the history of Rome, you did, you did it a couple of years ago. Am I, am I going to do cultural stuff for the history of Rome anymore? Or in Saturnalia special for, you know, for us, uh, <laughs> No, I have to explain the Russian Revolution between now and the summer of 2021. It's going to take every fiber of my being to condense that down. I can't stop for Christmas. Lenin didn't stop for Christmas. <laughs> Lenin kept going. Lenin doesn't give a shit about Christmas, so I can't either. Yeah, there you go. Collateral material, maps, and uh, references, and so on. And uh, to be honest, I've been listening to you since like, about 2011. I have rarely looked like at, at any website supporting material or, or anything like that. So, 
And I suspect that's not unusual because of the circumstances that you described in which we consume the content. Right. Um, um, so how do you decide to, how to allocate your time? Because you, because you know there's going to be somebody who's going to write you and say, hey, this is, you should have provided a map. This was really, you know, this, this campaign was puzzling to you know, you know, figure out without a map. That is true, and I made a decision at one point that I was going to focus all of my time and attention on writing the script and recording that script. And uh, there, there, was a, there was quite a while that I was, I was doing a lot of labor-intensive map making um, for the history of Rome, and I was doing it in Revolutions too. And yes, that stuff, I, I would, really what I should probably do is like hire somebody to do that for me, but I can't hire somebody because I'm just this like one-man operation. Um, but most of the time, most people are listening to it, again, in their car or doing, you know, you're, you're listening to a podcast in part because you can't sit down in front of the TV and watch something um, and watch a YouTube video. So I do put just all my time and attention and effort and energy into making the narrative and the script as good as it can possibly be, rather than trying to peel off and additionally create a bunch of visual material to make it an audio visual experience because most of the time most people are experiencing this as a purely audio ex purely and, and of course it's I got a lot of feedback from people that would say like okay pull up your map and you can follow along and they're like I'm stuck in traffic man I can't pull up the map like well you're referencing a map I can't look at so my, my answer is that basically I focus entirely on the audio and the, the visual stuff has completely dropped off. Uh, I'm curious, you mentioned that making an educational podcast is, is a two-way street, you're picking up on stuff. You have to understand the topic to be able to communicate it in a pleasing, understandable way. Um, but aside from educating you, how have you found podcasting has affected you, your personal opinions, or like, has it adjusted you as a person? <coughs> Yeah, nice simple question. Nothing, nothing. Is this is this is this a back way of asking me if revolutions has radicalized me? <laughs> Everybody's all. It's, you seem to have been radicalized by revolutions. Okay, okay. I've been reading a lot of anarchism lately. Um, I think uh, uh, there are there are things that I haven't changed. I'm still the same person I was when I went into this in 2021. Um, there are definitely parts of my understanding of the world that have changed significantly since I started doing the history of Rome and, and revolutions. I mean, I've been at this for 12 years. It would, be, it would be a profound tragedy, I think, if I, I don't know how many books I've read for these shows, however many hundreds or maybe I'm touching a thousand books, to have read all of that and then walk out the other side of it and be like, yeah, I'm basically the same person I was before. I mean, that would, that would, be, that would be a tragedy. Um, so it is, it is hard to like pinpoint because all of these things happen very slowly over time. Um, I can say, I know this for a fact, that I have changed a lot uh, after having done the Haitian Revolution in particular. Like the, the, what I think about the world before I did the Haitian Revolution and what I think about the world and the United States and the Atlantic world in general since I've done the Haitian Revolution, that was a very large, there was a very large tumbler that fell into place that opened up my eyes to a lot of different things, that opened up my eyes to a new understanding and appreciation for what the history of the world actually is, not just the history of the world as I received it as a child and as somebody who went through high school and went through university. Um, missing a story that is one of the most profoundly important stories that has ever happened in human history and to not really know anything about it and then to know everything about it, I mean, I, I really do feel like that opened up my eyes quite a bit and I'm sure that's, what, that's one example that I know that I can absolutely point to. There's probably a million other, maybe not a million, maybe like 900,000 um, different little things that I don't even necessarily register as something that I'm, I'm, I think differently about it now, but I know that I think differently about things now. And again, if, if I didn't think differently about things after having read all of this, then I am not doing it right. In a world that you work in, where facts aren't facts, and history gets downgraded every year, even supported less in our cultural sphere, 
and there's so much attention deficit with social media and the amount of information we can gather. Do you ever feel like the work you do kind of equals a social practice or has any advocacy to it? Has any, what's the last word? Advocacy. Has any advocacy to it? Um, I, I haven't thought about it like that. Um, I do think about it in terms of I do have, I do feel a sense of responsibility in terms of how much I want to get everything correct and right when I'm putting this out there into the world because there is a lot of slapdash material or just straight up inaccurate material that is out there on like YouTube, right? And so I can't change the whole world. If I could, I promise I would. <laughs> I promise I would make things better <laughs> if I could, but I can't. Um, so all I can do is control the work that I do and the work that then I contribute into this thing we call like the capital D discourse. And as long as I'm putting out good, compelling, factual information that people listen to, that at least part of their day is filled with something that is compelling and factually accurate and uh, uh, it will enlighten them about the history of the world uh, as opposed to just being more bright noise or fake news or fake information or just a you know, walloping pack of lies that are being dumped on our heads like every single day out there. This happens to me too. I feel like whatever that little contribution that I can make, that there is a mixture that is out there and all I can do is just create my little part of it, add to the mixture of let's have this be honest and true and about a process of actually trying to understand the world we live in rather than the other side of it, which is let's say whatever we want to try to manipulate reality to get something selfishly out of this, right? Which is I think where all of that sort of quote unquote fake news is coming from is a desire to manipulate things for your own advantage. I, I'm not trying to manipulate anybody here for my own advantage. Um, I am trying to, I, all I ever wanted to do was just explain what happened, that's it. <laughs> is that gonna be the, no, we'll do, we'll do, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll do, we'll do. You just tell the information in your podcast, mm -hmm. but like a big part of what I enjoy, and especially like what I enjoy history writing myself, is getting to express my own interpretation yeah. of history, not necessarily like soapbox, that sort of thing, but like how do you think the role of like self-expression through your interpretation of history changes between like a podcast and a book, like something that you've written, like do you think it really changes at all, like your self-expression style there or something? Um, I like the difference between how I express myself in the book versus the podcast um, was is much was more stylistic in terms of I do I did feel like I had to write in a different in a slightly different voice uh, for the book than I do for the podcast it was a little bit more formal it was a little bit clearer and simpler as opposed to the podcast which is just like a little bit more informal and has you know more jokes uh, in it because I do think people need to laugh along the way but my, my focus has been, like the, one of the roles that I think I fulfill is there, what the interpretation that you're talking about. Oftentimes, people will come into history as a discipline or history as a subject, and there is a lot of um, thematic explorations of theory, right? There's a lot of theory, there's a lot of philosophical stuff, and what people feel often is lacking from their understanding is just the brass tacks of what actually happened, right? Who did what when, right? I don't, like, when did Robespierre do what? Like, it, this isn't about just, you know, who, how does Robespierre fit into the French Revolution in the course of national history? What role does he play? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Like, all that stuff. You can find that in a lot of places, and what I think that I'm have been trying to provide and what I keep my focus on, uh, both in the history of Rome and revolutions, you're always going to get who and what and when. And then I will do the why and the how in order to explain people's motivations or, or put this in some kind of context. But mostly what I want my listeners walking away from is an appreciation, of, or is, is an understanding of the, the basic skeletal framework of who and what and when. 
And if you have that basic skeletal framework of who and what and when, then you can go back and you can read things that are more focused on theory or interpretation or trying to analyze, um, critically analyze some piece of history. And then you'd be like, oh yeah, this person's talking about, you know, the rivalry between Danton and Robespierre. Oh, I understand that. I listened to that guy's show. That was like, there was like 15 episodes about the relationship between Robespierre. It was, I don't think there were 15 episodes on the relationship. Yeah, there were a lot. So that's what I'm trying to do. I am, I, I'm always, like at the beginning of a week, um, I am always trying to ask myself, who, who, who did what when? Like that's what I'm trying to get across to people so that you have that narrative framework that then you can build all of this additional interpretation that you want to do. And of course, you know, like I, my vo I have, of course I'm gonna have my own interpretations are slipping into this, my own biases are gonna be slipping into this, my unconscious or conscious. Um, but th that's always my focus. That's why I'm always gonna give you names and I'm always gonna give you dates. And if you say, there's too many names and too many dates, I say, suck it up, we're learning scales and you can't write music until you learn your scales. Is, we're gonna wrap it up right there. Thank you very much.